Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Greek God training program by Alex Eubank. It has been a while since I critiqued someone else's training program and I tell it on Alex because I reviewed his channel recently and upon revisiting some of his content, I realized that he does actually share a ton of programming information. The question is whether or not that information is good. So the best way to answer that question in details would be to look at the type of split that he produces and follows and see if it actually is worth following or if it's just going to end up being garbage. It's going to help us compare and contrast between the type of programs that are available on the market right now for younger lifters, the younger generation, and the type of splits that we, the millennials, the oldest generation had to deal with when YouTube Fitness just got started. Are the Zoomers better off? Do they have better programs? Or was the golden generation of lifting on this platform, the one with starting strength, with all of these old school programs, the better option for building muscle? Uh, the reason why I settled on Alex Subank is because he's pretty much the king of Zoomers. He's extremely popular with them and therefore it is very likely that many of them follow his program. So if you are an Alex Subank fan, a Zoomer yourself, it's going to be a great video as well because it's going to answer the question of whether or not you should stay on that split or move away from it. When it comes to the Greek God split, it is a body part split, which from the get-go means that it's either going to be really good or really bad. And it is three days, so you have three days that are going to each target different muscle groups, but each of these days is split in two. So in total, you'll have two variations of each day, and if you know how to do math, three multiplied by two is six. So you're supposed to run this routine six days a week. When I see this, I'm expecting to see low volume, medium intensity, because this is very high frequency. This is already an issue because even though Alex himself is not a novice, the majority of people who follow him are novices, and it's extremely hard to justify training six days per week as a novice. That being said, if it's done properly, it is doable. So let's see if it's done properly. So the split is Monday, Thursday, Alex trains chest and back. Tuesday, Friday, he trains shoulders and arms. Wednesday, Saturdays are going to be dedicated to legs. And on Sunday, he rests. Looking at this, this looks fairly balanced. The recovery aspect seems to be on point. When it comes to the exercise selection, we can look at the chest and back, for example. He will do things like incline dumbbell bench, barbell roll, bench press, wet grip, blood pull down, all good exercises. The first pit stop and the first thing we must look at is the exercise selection that we just did and then the rep range. Because even if you have a great exercise selection, if the rep range is out of whack, it is simply not going to function. So let's look at it. Incline dumbbell bench, five sets of six to 12. Reasonable, high volume. Barbell row, six to 12 as well. Great, high volume for the barbell row. That way you don't end up ego lifting and just trying to get five reps max on the barbell row, which is idiotic, okay? Bench press, 10 reps, perfect. Lat pull down, 12 reps. So we see that in terms of the rep range, he always shoots for the highest possible number without going overboard. I don't see any 30 reps, any 25 reps in the program so far. That is already a good sign. This means that it's going to be a proper routine for aesthetics. We are looking at the intensity range and we try to stay intense. Yes, we go to failure, yes, but we are far away from one rep max as well, far away from the expression of power that someone like a powerlifter would try to express, which is simply not needed for bodybuilding. So, so far, so good. For shoulders and arms, he selects movements like the dumbbell shoulder press, lateral raises, easy bar curl, incline curls, no gimmicky stuff, which is great because uh, Zoomers, for the most part, tend to be very receptive to novelty. So when you see a program that includes time-tested exercises, orthodox exercises, it is also a good sign. And the rep ranges are always the same. We're going to get back to it. It's always minimum of six reps, which can be detrimental because if the least amount of reps you can do is six, you're never going to truly taste the amount of intensity that something like a, a four to eight could create. Again, as I said, it's not a problem because you're supposed to train for aesthetics, so a higher volume is needed. But there's a specific aspect of Alex's methodology when it comes to training that creates an issue when paired with these high rep ranges. We're going to get to see that. And then for the legs, he does pretty basic stuff. I would even go as far as to say that it is fairly minimalistic. He does squats and deads. 
It does leg press, leg extension, armstring curls, and seated and standing calf raises. I told you that times and times again, when you program for bodybuilding, your upper body days and your exercise selection for upper body should look like a laundry list and your lower body exercise selection should look like a post-it, like a note left by someone on the fridge. This is how you're supposed to program. Why? Because each lift that you do with the lower body gives you much more volume and therefore much more systemic fatigue. So seeing this is already very encouraging. It is also potentially an issue because if you spam squats and dead, you're going to get obvious injuries, you're going to get tired of the lift. So including variations could be a thing. But so far, I'm presently surprised. It goes to show that at least when it comes to like the structure of the program and what is going to make its backbone, it is solid. That is already much better than what we had to deal with when we got started on YouTube Fitness. For those of you that were not there back then, most programs were bench, squat, deadlift, rows, and pull-ups if you are lucky. That was most programs, maybe a clean included in there. It was like bare bones. The issue is that it produced shit physiques because you're ignoring so many muscles. When I look at this, most muscles are being hit. Of course, there are always muscles that no one isolates. The abs, for example, are never present in that type of list. The neck is never present. The forms are never present. At this point, I've gotten used to it. It's just that these muscle groups are not part of, of the common zeitgeist and the common consciousness on YouTube fitness. But you'll see that they should be included because if you want a balanced physique, at some point, you have to start isolating these muscles. Let's look at the actual program because this is just the exercise selection. This is like looking at a list of ingredients for a cake and saying this is going to be a great cake. Well, it's not as simple. Of course, it's impossible to make a good cake with bad ingredients. So Alex has the first step on par. But the second part is making that cake. And if you bake that cake and you bake it wrong, it's going to be garbage. So let's see if he actually managed to make something proper with all of these exercises. On Monday, Alex trains chest and back. It's an interesting split. These are not synergistic muscles at all, but they are antagonistic, which means that you're not going to have to compete for performance. You can do rows and you can do bench, knowing that your bench, uh, your bench sets are not going to damage your ability to be performant on the row. So this can be a good idea if you know what you're doing. A red flag that I see right off the bat is pec deck, two sets of 15 reps. So Alex uh, does something that people call pre-exhaustion, pre-fatigue, where he wants to target the chest first and foremost with an isolation movement so as to feel it more when he moves on to his presses. I disagree with that method for reasons I'm going to explain later. But after this, I also noticed that the exercise that follows this pre-fatigue is straight arm pull down. So at least he gives himself some room before the press to actually recuperate and to not let the pec deck actually damage his ability to perform on the press. So that's a good idea. The straight arm pull down is two sets of 15 reps. That is also a pre-fatigue for the lats. I think that this is much smarter because he's pre-fatiguing the lats before he moves on to barbell row. The thing with the barbell row is that you don't use only the lats. You use the entirety of the posterior chain. So pre-fatiguing the lats to fill them more on the movement makes sense. It makes no sense for a bench press because a bench press is mostly chest. He then moves on to set bench press, incline dumbbell bench, five sets of 12 reps. That's a lot of volume for your main press. And I would even argue that plus the pec deck, that's all you need for chest for the day, right? Keep that in mind because you'll see that it's relevant. 12 reps, I hope that he does evolving rep ranges. Doing 12, 12, 12, 12 is idiotic because you're sandbagging. It would be best to do something like an 8 to 12 reps. So you start, you get 12, then 12, then 11, then 10, then 8 or 9, etc. That way, you can actually go down in reps and you taste the maximum, the maximum amount of intensity possible. This is why if you want to do bodybuilding training and you want to do high rep ranges, I always recommend to have a range for the rep range. Don't do only five, uh, 15 reps, do 10 to 15. That way you can actually go down, as I said, and experience the fatigue and keep actually challenging the muscle. Then the barbell row, five sets of 12 reps, that's a shit ton of fatigue. It's a total of 50, 50 reps plus. Your back is going to be pretty tired at this point. I think that most people from this are already done pretty much, meaning that most novices from these two heavy exercises, 75% of the work is done. Alex continues with flat barbell bench, and that to me is a mistake. You already did five sets of inclined dumbbell bench. That is your main press for the day. You cannot move on to another main press, or it's going to be back off set. But in this case, I would argue that you would be better off just doing a rotation. One week, you do the dumbbell bench with the incline. Then you do the flat barbell bench. 
I know that people would tell me that incline dumbbell bench is mostly shoulders, but it also taxes the fuck out of the triceps and the pecs. Then wide grip pull down four sets of 12 reps. So that's the secondary movement for the upper back, much more uh, isolation focused because you don't use the posterior chain. All right, I can sort of buy into the idea that a more advanced lifter would need that amount of volume. But then cable flies, underhand pull downs, that's too much. This is when we get into the domain of junk volume. Cable flies for four sets of 12 reps, underhand pull down for four sets of 10 reps. The one saving grace, quote unquote, on of these exercises for the cable flies, for example, is that it's mostly a pump exercise, meaning that you're not looking for performance. So I guess if what you want is sensation, go ahead, but you're not going to gain much muscle from this. And then the underhand pull down, I cannot justify at all. You just did wide grip pull down. Why are you doing another variation of the pull down? Even if you vary the grip so, that, so as to be able to recruit more lats by going closer, I think that this also would justify a rotation. This is too much. And then you look at the amount of reps he does. That is a shit ton of reps. He already did a total of 80 reps on the pull downs. Plus the barbell rows, this is just simply not justifiable. Tuesday, shoulders, biceps, and triceps. So this is going to be an arm day, quote unquote. Uh, he doesn't call it that but that's what the split points up to. You start with lateral raises. I would argue that the majority of people, their shoulders would have not recuperated enough from the Monday to the Tuesday to justify eating shoulders again. That being said, it would potentially make sense if there was only one shoulder movement. As you come to understand, it's not what's going to happen. Now, uh, this is the main issue with Alex's program. He has a tendency to do way too much. So lateral raises, five sets of 20 reps. That is already a total of 100 reps. For set one, for your shoulders, 100 reps for your shoulders. That is a lot of work. Then you do dumbbell shoulder press. So you open with a lateral raise that is going to tax the shoulder, and then you do a press that requires the shoulder, knowing that you already did an incline press the day before. That's pole programming in my opinion. Five sets of 12 reps, super high volume again. Then real dart cable fly, three sets of 15 reps. So three exercises of shoulders back to back to back. Even if, even if you could handle that amount of volume, why put them back to back? Why don't you separate them in the day? You, you should separate them in the week in terms of frequency, but in the day, like that makes no sense. Then barbell curls, five sets of 12 reps. So it's the first bicep exercise of the week and of the day. Then barbell skull crushers, five sets, five sets of 12 reps. So these are good. These are great. That's, those are good rep ranges, good volume for the triceps, the long head of the triceps, and the biceps. Then incline dumbbell curl, five sets of 12 reps. So I don't like this exercise, but I understand that many people do. Uh, it's a secondary movement for the bicep for the day. Great. And then rope extensions, five sets of 12 reps. All right. So triceps and biceps, I like. Like this portion of the, the, the exercise selection, I like. What I don't like is the hyper-focus on shoulders. And I think he got it from uh, enhanced bodybuilders. And also it's because it's a thing with these aesthetic bras to just hammer their shoulders way too much. The only way to get through that workout is to use sub-maximal loads for all of these exercises, in which case, why not just do one? Just do your dumbbell shoulder press and then rotate it. Maybe for a lateral raise, because again, keep in mind that you already did a press before. If we were to be holistic, we can just go back onto the Monday and say, hey, why don't we just do barbell bench press on Monday? And that way we can justify doing a dumbbell shoulder press on Tuesday. Now it makes more sense. Now it is more balanced. I would go as far as to say also that this Tuesday is not needed. Meaning that we can take the exercise on the Tuesday and dispatch them on other days. But we're going to get to see that because if you are on this program, I'm going to make a constricted version of it that makes more sense. So let's move on to the Wednesday. The Wednesday is the leg day. He starts with leg extensions, four sets of 15 reps. So he's pre fatiguing the quad. I'm not going to hop onto that, onto that too much. At the end of the video, I'm going to explain to you why you shouldn't be doing that. Then barbell squats, five sets of 12 reps. That's a shit ton of volume for the back squat. Then leg press, four sets of 15 reps. So he destroys his quads and his glutes. Then leg curl, four sets of 12 reps. So that's the only hamstring movement for that day. Keep in mind that the squat, yes, does work the hamstring, but this is a very unbalanced day, meaning that it's very quad focused. Again, not a surprise. The aesthetic craze hyper prioritizes shoulders. It also hyper prioritizes quads over hamstrings. The issue is that this can create some imbalances down the line, which are going to lead to knee issues. So be careful, you have to train your hamstrings. Then seated calf raises, four sets of 15 reps. That's low volume for the calves, but for someone who's getting started with calf, calf training, it's absolutely doable. What I would do on that day instead is a barbell squat followed by a Romanian deadlift. 
That way you get a total workout for the posterior chain as well. And then you can do your leg curls. That's what, that way, if you want more isolation for the quads, you absolutely can. And if we were to again talk supersets, barbell back squat not supersetted, RTRs not supersetted, and then you can do your leg curls supersetted with uh, something like the seated calf raises. It doesn't compete, the same muscles are not being used, so you are absolutely Gucci. Thursday's chest and back. You start with a wide grip pull down, which not a problem. If that is your main lat movement for the day, why not? Four sets of 15 reps, super high volume. I would prefer something like uh, maybe an 8 to 12, an 8 to 10 even. Then incline dumbbell bench, so he really does love his incline dumbbell bench. Four sets of 12 reps, then close grip pull down. So the secondary pull down for the day, four sets of 12 reps, to me, pick one. Pick one type of pull down for the day, go to fire, get your fatigue, get your stimulus, then move on. Then flat dumbbell fly, okay, so that's the secondary movement for the chest. We already have two movements for the upper back, two movements for the chest, okay? Then seated cable row, so that's the third exercise for the upper back, four sets of 10 reps. Then plate loaded flat bench, four sets of 10 reps. Do you really need a third chest exercise on that day? I don't think so. Then straight arm pull down, so another movement for the upper back, the fourth one, three sets of 12 reps, and then push-ups, three sets of as many reps as, many reps as possible. Do you think that the type of volume you will get on push-ups for that day is going to be relevant? You're already so burnt out that it's just completely junk volume. It's way too much. You know, when you are an influencer, you can justify spending so much time in the gym because you take pictures of yourself, so it's pretty much how you make your money. But if you're a regular Joe, how do you justify spending that much time in the gym knowing full well that you could do less and get better results? Because this is way too much for an average lifter. To recover from this, I think I would struggle to recover from this because I would take every single exercise to fire and actually push. What I think Alex does is he mitigates the amount of intensity via the rep ranges and he goes for the pump. We'll get back to that later. He himself admits it. I watched a video where he talks about training for aesthetics. It's what he does. He sandbags constantly. But the question is, why sandbag when you could just reduce the amount of workload that you do and just train more intensely? Now you save time and you get the exact same muscular results. So for the Friday, shoulders, biceps and triceps again, the day that I think is the worst in the program because it's not justifiable. You can take all of these exercises for biceps and triceps and just place them on chest and back. And that, that would be it. Even leg day. It's not a sin to train something on leg day that is not the legs. You could do your biceps on leg day, and that would save two days. Instead of six days a week, the problem is now four days. And that opens up pockets of recovery for you to actually get results. Because when do you rest with this program? I mean, I understand that it's, the split is done in a fashion so as to make sure that you train, for example, shoulders and biceps on Tuesday. Then again, you train them on Friday. But look at the amount of work for the shoulders, for example. You never have time to recuperate. How are you supposed to perform on presses if you do that amount of work? It's going to become a problem at some point. So for this Friday, you start with seated lateral raises, five sets of 20, so again, a shit ton of volume. Then Smith machine shoulder press. Why place the press after the isolation? Always open with the compounds, always. But this is a terrible idea. You damage your performance on the press. Then upright row, okay, three sets of 12. This is, a, this is realistic. Three sets of 12 is not too much for this movement. It's just so ba too bad that it happens after two shoulder exercises, so you have no juice. Then dumbbell curl, why not place the dumbbell curl earlier in the day? Five sets of 12 reps, then cable barbell curl. So now you end up doing curl curl, which again, hurts performance. Why not shoulder curl, shoulder curl, if you absolutely want to do that much work. And then dumbbell scroll crusher. Work for the long head is just the right amount. The amount of work for the biceps is just the right amount. It's just that he works shoulders so much that it sort of hurts his ability to isolate these muscles, which shows in his physique, by the way. He has very advanced shoulders. His biceps and triceps are really lagging behind. And I saw a video of his where he complained about having small arms and saying how it sucks being natty because you have small arms. It's not because he's natty, it's because he doesn't know how to train his arms. The days that he allocates for arms, which are two arms days a week, that's more than most people, he trains mostly shoulders. So of course he's going to have an imbalance. And then on Saturday, um, I just need to read you this, this opening sentence because it's too funny. Two leg days per week show what a beast Alex Eubank is when training his lower body. Two leg days a week is the bare minimum. Unless you're a complete novice, you should train your legs more than once a week. That's it. This is the bro split mindset again. You start with leg curls, four sets of 15, then deadlifts, five sets of 12. Why would you pre-fatigue your arm strings before you do a movement that trains the arm strings? Do one set, 
right? You can warm up your hamstrings with the leg curl, but don't tire it. You're going to end up over recruiting the lower back because the mover of the movement, the posterior chain, is going to be too fatigued. And then five sets of 12 reps is way too much volume for the lift. It is absolutely unneeded. That rep range to start with, I don't like. The rep, the deadlift is an intense lift. Do not take it to such heights. Five reps is great. Three reps is great. Just there's no there's no necessity for this in a program, especially not with five sets. This is ridiculous. If you want to do a deadlift like movement with that rep range, do remain in deadlifts instead. The stimulus to fatigue ratio is much better than leg press. Four sets of 15, so he had the presence of mind of including a leg movement that doesn't include the lower back, so props for that, that's good. Then leg extension, so secondary movement for the quads, okay, so far so good. <laughs> then standing calf raises, then squats. I hope this is a mistake. I hope it's not actually what he does. Why would you end your day with squats? Four sets of 12 reps after five sets of 12 reps on deadlifts? Plus, you did leg press and leg extension. What type of squats is it going to be? You're going to use like 60% of your max tops. This is junk volume. Do not do that. And then Sunday, Alex rests. He maybe goes to church. I don't know. But uh, yeah, he has one rest day a week that is very little. Now, if I were to try to reconstruct this program so as to make it more relevant and to actually save you time and give you more recovery pockets, what I would do is... Monday, it would be your chest, back, shoulders, and triceps day. Uh, Wednesday would be your leg and bicep day. Thursday would be your chest, back, uh, triceps, and shoulders day. And then Saturday would be your leg and biceps day. This is a better split. For, for most people, this would be a better split. It just makes much more sense. Once you become more advanced, you can justify training on these Tuesdays and Fridays by doing a proper arm day. And you can start including all of the muscles that are being completely neglected in the program. For example, hey, you do an arm day. Guess what is part of the arm? The forearm is also part of the arm. Why don't you isolate your forearms? So you can get some forearm isolation movement going. You can maybe get some more bicep isolation movement going if that is what you wish. You can train your neck. You can even start doing more movements for the traps, for example, that I don't see here. Maybe some GPP, whatever. But what I always encourage people to do when they program for bodybuilding is start small and then expand. 
If you start with a six days a week program, the issue is that once you're going to try and find more space in the program to put more stuff, where do you put it? You already occupied the entirety of the schedule. Start with three to four days and then when you absolutely have to add an additional day. But always try to slash sets that are not needed. Two sets for a body part a day is plenty. The rest can be allocated to other muscle groups that are not trained and that frees you so much time. I absolutely recommend anyone who runs this program to actually do the modifications that I tell you to do and you will find that you are going to be much better off. So in conclusion, when it comes to this program, is it a good program? No. Is it a bad program? Also no, because if I were to go back to my the premise of this video, comparing it to other programs, this compared to starting strength is much better. But the issue is that they're both extremes. Starting strength was way too intense with rep ranges that were way too low, not enough variation in the lifts and a ton of muscles that were completely ignored. This is way too much work, way too high volume, rep ranges that are way too high and muscles that are just being completely tortured to a point where it makes no sense. You have to strike the middle ground. You have to be in the middle. This program, once you apply this mindset, is going to be much better. I think that the very high exercise selection is a good thing because it's going to give you options. And it's something that I heard him say, uh, Alex say in a video recently in terms of aesthetics, where he told people that it's nice to try and be optimal, but what is always best for you in terms of what to follow is what you can stick to. I think that he's absolutely correct. You're not supposed to chase optimal movements do movements that you like. That being said, you should apply the same mindset to his program because it is very hard to stick to that type of program. It's way too much work. You're going to be burnt out. It's one of these programs where at some point you start looking at the clock and you're like, when can I go home? And that's why I said that. I think that what Alex does is he, fo he focuses on the pump, not because the pump is the best way to grow, but because it's the only way to survive that program. Are you kidding me? If you do four exercises for the shoulders, yeah, you better get some sensation in the shoulders and fall good with the blood flowing because if not, you're just going to want to shoot yourself in the face. So we can move away from that by simply reducing the amount of work that we do. We can also reduce the rep range that we do and we can reduce the frequency, all things that I told you to do in my modifications because if you don't, you end up with a massive workload that is simply not possible to handle for the average person and not even justifiable at all. This six days a week split should really be a four days a week split. Now, why exactly does Alex train like this? Well, it's because his application of progressive overload is not standard. As he said himself, he is not concerned with progressive overload, which makes a ton of sense when you look at the amount of exercises he does in a day. What he does instead is he takes away the part of progressive overload where you're supposed to add weight on the bar and therefore match intensities to be able to progress with weight on the bar. And he hyper focuses on the rest. He hyper focuses on volume, on frequency, on sets and on reps. If you're the type of person that always focuses on weight on the bar and refuses to do more reps or sets, you're going to eventually run into the realization that your ability to put weight on the bar is now limited. It's the same thing here. You can focus on things like time under tension as much as you want. You can try to up the volume. You can do high intensity techniques like pre-exhaustion. This doesn't make up for progressive overload. The only thing it does is that it makes you feel like you're training harder. It gives you the sensation that you're training harder. But in terms of mechanical stress on the muscle, it does absolutely nothing. And for those of you that are maybe a bit confused by what I mean, Take time and attention, for example. Time and attention stipulates that you're not going to look at the weight you use. What you're going to pay attention to is the tempo and the amount of time you spend lifting. This is typical of people who bodybuild who think that you can make up for a lack of weight and mechanical tension by artificially recreating the tension by going slow. The problem is that you really realize that I don't care how slowly you move a 25 pound dumbbell, if you have the ability and if the muscle has the ability to move 50 pounds with good form, you should always use 50 pounds. You understand that I don't care what you do with the 25 pound dumbbell. I don't care the situation you put yourself into. No amount of tempo work is going to make up for the fact that you are using 50% of the muscle's ability to actually move. And just because it feels hard does not mean that you work hard. Do a test for me. Go grab an easy bar and do your curl with a tempo of five seconds up, five seconds down. Tell me how many reps you get. You're going to get like maybe 20% of what you could get normally if you just repped it. Do you think that this means that this is a good method to train? 
No, put weight on that easy bar, go to fire with a relevant rep range, and that will always be better. Things like tempo and time under tension are the cherry on top. They are at the bottom of the pyramid of priorities when it comes to progressive overload. These are gimmicks most of the time. What matters the most for progressive overload is the ability to push the workload by adding weight on the bar, doing more reps with the weight, doing more sets with the weight, and doing more work throughout the week by adding up frequency, by adding up extra days. Anything after that, the drop sets, the time under tension, the pre-exhaustion, all of it can be used, I'm not saying not to use it, but if it ends up replacing the, the golden core of progressive overload, you are just shooting yourself in the foot in terms of progression. Now, as promised, I'm also going to explain to you why pre-exhausting a muscle is a bad idea. I'm not telling you not to warm up the muscle. Like, for example, if you like to do squats and you like to do leg extensions before because it makes you feel the quads, absolutely do it. But never get into rep ranges or workloads that are going to damage your ability to squat. If you end up taxing the quads before you train the squats, of course you're going to fill them more. But guess what? You're also not going to be able to recruit them as much. And that is for a simple reason. It's because pre-exhaustion artificially lowers the ability of the muscle to perform by putting you in a state of relative intensity, which only damages your performance and reduces tension. In simple terms, it means that you took away from the muscle's ability to produce force, meaning that, of course, you squat less and you think to yourself, oh, I get more out of less weight. Wrong. You're getting less out of less weight. It's not that the quad is more challenged, it's that it lacks the ability to be challenged, and that makes all of the difference. I understand that pro bodybuilders swear by it. They swear by it because for the most part for them, training with super high intensities is too dangerous and they can get away with doing more volume. You can't. For the most part, naturals are going to suffer from that practice. So be careful. On top of that, also keep in mind that by disallowing your training to go up in intensity with the simple method of progressively overloading by putting more weight on the bar, you also end up having to do more. Because you have to make up for this lack of intensity. Your sets are not as intense anymore. So what do you do? You do more and more and more. This is why I said that I understand why Alex is stuck in the gym for hours and trains six times a week. It's because at some point, if you reduce to shrink down, you end up with a long list of exercises that take you forever when you could do less in the means and methods I explained previously. But the only way to do less is to accept that you're going to have to be in higher intensity rep ranges for certain lifts, to push too far on certain lifts, because it's the only way to be able to push away the rest of the volume, because now it stops being justifiable. If you stick to what Alex does, which is his method of progressively overloading by doing reps and sets, yes, of course, you have to do that much work, because it's the only way to get an amount of work that is going to be relevant and make the muscle grow. I think that it's not a bad thing that Alex is pushing this method on people because it's also good to keep in mind that weight on the bar is not the only mean of progressively overloading. But at some point, you are going to run into issues because when you want to progress past a certain point and you run into plateaus, just adding sets does nothing, right? If you're stuck at, I don't know, a 200-pound bench, you can do as many sets of 200 pound bench as you want. At some point, this intensity no longer challenges the muscle. So not only do you hurt your ability to go more intense, but you also hurt your ability to get quality volume because eventually all of these extra sets you do are just junk volume. And this is the problem that anyone who runs this program is going to eventually run into. If you are interested in learning more, I actually made a video last week about the 85% rule. It's a simple set of guidelines to follow to be able to balance your program and to understand when you do too much and when you do too little. It's in the description for those of you who are interested. If you don't quite yet understand how to program for yourself, you can either run the modified program that I just described to you in this video, or you can again check the description. There is the Apollonian Physic Workout that is an aesthetic-based workout for novices that is extremely condensed and is going to give you a good idea of what high-intensity work is and also why we want to do that high-intensity work because it gives you a lot of space to then expand the program. Whereas if you try to run this and try to adapt it to your own needs, which you should do because Alex tells you not to run in his own programs, you're going to run into an issue. What do you take away? What do you add? All of that takes the knowledge of frequency, volume, and intensity, which you might be lacking. Understand that it's absolutely not necessary to train six times a week as a beginner, especially if your goal is to replicate Alex's massive gains. I understand that if you are new to the gym, he looks very impressive, but keep in mind that he is, quote-unquote, only 170. 
mean that this is not his final form. He has a lot of room to grow. I don't know if he's going to be able to grow as a natty with that type of methods though, because he's going to start running into some issues as I already explained. But for you, it would be much smarter to start with a more intense base and then expand from here because you can absolutely get the same body as Alex. He is nothing special when you look at his videos, when he's not in pictures with good lighting and Photoshop, he looks fairly small. To be fair with you, he has small arms. I already explained why he has small arms is because he doesn't train them properly. But in most cases, and in all cases in reality, his methods are going to end up being detrimental. So if you can keep one thing from the way Alex trains is that you should train with movements that you enjoy. You should train every single muscle. You should not shy away from doing more volume if it's needed. But for the rest of his advice, the focus on reps and sets for progressive overload and ignore intensity and weight on the bar, all of that is just going to end up running you into the ground, maybe even destroying your love for bodybuilding and aesthetics because you are going to quickly realize that this is way too much. You do not need to do that much. Please do not do that much. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.